they're doing so, uh, let me let you know where we've been as a church uh, over the last few weeks. We've been in a series called 2020 Vision, and this series really is based on our discipleship path here at Grace Church. So God uh, does a few things in our life, and this is how we experience them on our end. The first thing is that God reaches us by his grace, and it's a free gift that God has poured out on every person. And then we can get connected to Jesus in a relationship, find our sins forgiven, a new life. And then also a new life with new people, the people of God. And then from there, God's not done. In fact, he's just getting started. Because next, God wants to give us what's called sanctifying grace. That means he's going to form us into his very own image and restore to us the image of God he created us with. And then we're still not done because God's going to then send us out to do what? Reach more people <laughs> so that they can get connected, form, and sent. All this brings glory to God. I hope that you've been catching the vision. We're going to wrap up this series uh, right now today. So take out your message notes you received on your way in as we get ready for part four of this series, 2020 Vision. series with an interview with Dr. Heather Trappigan, who's an optometrist at a Full Spectrum Family Vision Center. And uh, Dr. Heather told us about the intricacies of the human eye and helped us understand more of that. Now, as Thomas and I went to shoot this video, I decided to take an opportunity to learn something about going to the eye doctor that's always bothered me. I thought I could ask Heather to help me out with something that's really troubled me. I don't think I'm alone in this. Let me just see. Has anybody else gotten really stressed out when the eye doctor starts quizzing you about which is better, one or two, two or one, one or two, two or one, three or one, one or nine. I, I just get so stressed by that. Okay, I'm not alone, right? You get stressed by this too, yes? Okay, so I thought, what's the deal with this thing? Because here's, here's my dirty little secret. Sometimes they actually look the same. And so I just find myself having to lie at the eye doctor and it feels, I'm like, I don't know, I guess two. And they're like, well, let's try it again. One or two, two or one, one or two. So when we were there, I thought Heather can solve this mystery for me. So turn your attention to screens, watch this. Is it one or is it two? <laughs> better one, better two really just depends on what your answer is. You might give me the wrong one, right? <laughs> no, no, honestly, the, the better one, better two, we're just naming the letters. There's really no, or naming the, the choices. There's really no wrong answer. And that's what I try to tell patients all the time. You, we really want the choices to be the same. So once we get to that they look the same, that's what we're wanting. We don't really have a better one or better two. It's just giving you a choice. Thinking you think you have some control. <laughs> There is no better one or two. Are you kidding me? After all these years of stress, there is no better one or two. Who knew? Wow, the goal is to have them look the same. I did not know that, did you? Uh, today I wanna to provide us a little opportunity for a spiritual eye exam. Uh, so I want you to play along with me, okay, are you ready? Uh, and here's how you can tell me one or two, one or two, two or one, one or two. And uh, here's what I want you to do, just hold up your hand and you can just do one finger or two. Okay, so everybody ready? Everybody has to play along. This is mandatory fun time. Okay. So I want to ask you about the Christian life. So is following Jesus more about number one, me loving God, or number two, loving other people? Which is it? One or two, two or one, one or two. Is it about number one, loving people near me or loving people globally? One or two, two or one, one or two. Is it about the future or is it about life here right now? Which one? Which one? One or two, one or two. Okay. Last, uh, no, second last one. Is it about reading my Bible? That's number one. Or number two, feeding the poor? Uh, one or two. Two or one. Okay. Last one. Is following Jesus more about heaven? That's number one. Or number two, life here on earth? Heaven, number one. 
to life here on earth. One or two, two or one, one or two. These are tough choices, aren't they? In fact, here's what I'm discovering about the Christian life is that the goal of the Christian life is for one and two to look the same. There is no better one or better two even when it comes to these choices that Christians often debate. I mean, think with me. The Bible teaches us that loving God is always tied to loving other people. The Bible teaches that yes, we should read the Bible, but we should also put the Bible into practice by doing things like feeding the poor, right? Um, the, as God grows our heart, we're able to love people who are nearby, but we're also able to love people who are far away, globally. And this one may be a surprise, but following Jesus is about heaven transforming the way we see planet Earth. That we wouldn't see a difference between one or two, meaning heaven and Earth. So thankfully the Bible can help us with this, and it has a lot to say about sight. So take a look with me at Colossians 3, 1 through 4, a letter that the Apostle Paul writes to some first century followers of Jesus, and here's what he says. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of where? Heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. All right, if you're taking notes, underline those words. Uh, set your sights on the realities of heaven. What is Paul getting at here? He's saying that you and I need to focus on, reflect on heaven, but why? Not just so we can wait until we die. We focus on heaven so it transforms the way that we live, where? Here on earth. In fact, one of my seminary professors, Dr. Steve Siemens, says that Paul is writing to his friends because he wants their earth to be crammed with heaven. He wants what's up there to come down here. And I wanna pose that question for you to think about for a moment. What would it look like if earth was crammed with more of heaven? Would that be a good thing? Yeah, I think so. My earth needs a little bit more heaven. <laughs> even in my own life. When I lose sight of heaven, my depression can come and swallow me up in a pit of despair. Some of you have been there. When my anxieties are raging, it's usually in part because I've lost sight of heaven. When I lose sight of that, I think things are falling apart. I need Jesus to uh, help me see heaven one more time. If there's no heaven and I'm not focused on heaven, then I'm just kind of lost here on earth because what is life all about anyway? If there's no heaven, if I lose sight of that, then what do we do? We just live life to get more pleasure, to earn some more stuff, to gain the world's prestige? Is that what this is all about? I don't think so. That's not enough to live for. But when I catch a glimpse of heaven, things change right here on earth. When I see that Jesus was actually our Savior who lived and breathed and walked among us and then he was crucified on a cross, went down into a grave and then raised to new life. Well then friends, everything changes. And I think our world is in need of more of heaven. Our earth needs more of heaven in it. And Jesus didn't describe heaven as somewhere only beyond the blue. He described heaven as right here among us. In fact, look at the scripture passage from Matthew 4, 17. Let's read this out loud together. Ready? Go. From then on. All right, where's the kingdom of heaven? It's near. It's right here among us. And what is a kingdom after all? Well, a kingdom is a place where anybody uh, has a king. And for followers of Jesus, we have said that Jesus is our king. So if the kingdom of heaven is wherever Jesus is king, then that can be right here, right now in your life. It can be among us. It can be even present in Cape Coral and also around the world. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is near. Yes, heaven is also a place we're gonna go when we die. It's a place where we're gonna get resurrected bodies that are perfect, hallelujah. Um, it's a place where we're gonna be reunited with those that we love. That's wonderful news. But the good news is for us right here, right now, is that Jesus is bringing heaven to earth. 
That's why he healed sick people. That's why he raised people from the dead. That's why he forgave people of sins because none of those things exist in heaven. And this series, 2020 Vision, has been about us catching a glimpse of heaven. It's about us being able to see with spiritual eyes. Now, last week, Pastor George said for us to be able to do this, the end game in all of this, to have this 2020 vision means that we are to be conformed into the image of Christ. Would you say that? Conformed into the image of Christ. Now, think about this statement. It sounds pretty good when I say it. Okay, conformed to the image of Christ. Sounds nice. But there's a word in that sentence that I don't like. It's the word conformed. You know what it means to conform? It means to obey. <laughs> oh boy. It means to abide by or comply or follow. And most of the time in my brain, I don't willingly want to conform. In fact, quietly, secretly, I am a non-conformist. This is why I like to go to Burger King, because I like to have it my way. <laughs> this is why I like Frank Sinatra, who sings, I did it my way. That's right. Honestly, I want to do things my way. I want to drive as fast as I want to. I want to stay up as late as I want to. I want to binge watch as much television as I want to. I want to eat as much chocolate as I want to. I want to uh, do things my way. Sometimes, now my wife's not here right now. Okay. Sometimes I don't want to do what my wife tells me to do. I know. Pastor George is out of town too, so I'll talk about him. So sometimes I don't want to do what Pastor George tells me to do. Our bishop is not here, so I'll tell, sometimes I don't want to do what our bishop tells me to do. Sometimes even I don't want to do what God tells me to do. Just being honest, God says you need to love that person. You know what I'm thinking? Mm, no. <laughs> I want to do it my way. <laughs> the Bible has a word for this, my condition. It's called sin. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's what that is. Yeah, that's what that is. It's when we take our pride and our will, my will, and put it above God's will. Instead of Jesus being king, I think I'm the king. And that's when I've got it all wrong. Because for us to be formed into the image of Christ, we need to be conformed to him. And Jesus says, if anybody wants to follow me, you need to take up your cross. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. What does that mean to take up our cross? Some people said, well, I'm in this difficult situation, so that's just my cross to bear. That's not your cross to bear. Some people say, I've got a difficult person in my life. That's my cross to bear. That's not your cross to bear. Can I tell you where you're in my cross to bear is? It's taking our will and placing it underneath the weight of the cross of Jesus Christ, willingly so, to say, Jesus, I'll follow you. I'll go down the narrow path. I'll do what even is difficult by the power of your grace and Holy Spirit working in my life. That's what it means to be conformed into the image of Christ. It takes our participation. It takes our cooperation. And it transforms our life. And in fact, this is the life journey we're on until we meet Jesus face to face. And so I want to share with us uh, the answer to this question as the teaching team met. We talked about as a result of this new life in Christ, if we've been reached by his grace, connected to Jesus, had our sins forgiven, well, what next? In fact, as a result of my new life in Christ, what do I do now? Well, we join Jesus in bringing the wholeness of heaven to be a reality in the places of brokenness here on earth. We want to join Jesus in bringing the joy of heaven to right here on earth. So our going is inseparable from our being. Look with me at the first fill in the blank. As a result of my new life in Christ, your new life in Christ, here's what we need to do. We need to go throughout our daily life, every moment of every day, and yet we need to go with tenderness. Would you say that with me? Go with tenderness. This is what Paul uh, does when he reaches out to a first century group of Christians in Thessalonica. Everybody say Thessalonica. <laughs> Bless you. That's right. Thessalonica. <laughs> that actually is a cool place because it's the first church that was ever planted in Europe. And Paul did it and it was a very difficult task for him. And yet the, even when the people were difficult, he loves them 
with great tenderness. Look with me at what he says, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. He says, as apostles of Christ, we certainly had a right to make some demands of you, but instead we were like children among you, or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. Now, two images are placed back to back here. Paul says he doesn't come demanding anything. Instead, he says he comes as a child. Now, that might not seem uh, that shocking, and yet in the first century, children were considered property. They were nothing. They could be discarded. And yet, Paul says we humbled ourselves so much that we became like little children. But then he backs it up with another image. He says we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. This brings to my mind, seeing my wife Becky nurse our son Caleb in the hospital right after he was born, teaching him how to nurse. She, that was like a superhero moment for her. <laughs> it was unbelievable because of the tenderness she had to help Caleb on that day. So Paul uses these two images back to back and they're both images of great tenderness. There's a bumper sticker that says, um, please be patient with me because God ain't finished with me yet. Have you seen that one before? And I like that one because it is really the story of my life. God's not done with me yet, thank goodness. But people in my life have known this and they've come along with great tenderness. And it's because of their love, empowered by the Holy Spirit, that I'm standing here today. One of those guys uh, that came along and if it wasn't for him, I would not be a pastor today. I'm, I may not even be a Christian. His name was Alan. And Alan was a grocery store manager at a local grocery store um, when I was in high school. I was 15 years old. I was running from God. I, was, uh, I didn't want anything to do with God. My dad was a pastor, so I didn't want anything to do with church. And uh, I was making straight Ds. I was getting ready to get kicked off the, the farthest seat on the bench of the football team. And I was really at a crossroads in my life when I met Alan. I told my parents I didn't want to go to church anymore. And my dad said, well, guess what? You're going. And he then added this. He said, son, you're living on dangerous ground. <laughs> dangerous ground. So you need to go and listen. So that's when Alan, it was right about the same time that Alan, for some reason, this guy volunteered to be a high school Sunday school teacher. Now, when we get to heaven and people have palaces and nice places, it's going to be people that volunteered to be Sunday school teachers for high school students. <laughs> Alan is going to have a mansion because he had me in his class. And Alan had this joy about him, and yet he loved rock and roll. He had a great sense of humor. He was kind of irreverent, uh, and yet he also loved Scripture. He loved the Bible so much that it became contagious. And I actually, I didn't tell my parents this, but I actually liked going to Sunday school because I could hear about the Bible. But Alan, out of his tenderness, saw that I was in trouble and took it up a notch. And he started hanging out with me. He would get off work and he would arrange times that he could just take me out and get a hamburger and talk to me. One day I would gotten tickets to my favorite band, bought it with my paper route money, and my parents told me I was not allowed to go to see this band by myself because I was 15. And uh, it was actually a very good band named ZZ Top. And uh, I know, so this was a tragedy. And uh, they said the only way you can go is if you have an adult chaperone. I'm like, an adult chaperone? Wow, where do I find one of those? So I went and asked Alan, and Alan says, I've already got tickets, let's go, it's going to be fun. And Alan became my hero at that point, because he took me and was my chaperone. And all of these stories I can share about Alan, it was all his tenderness in loving me in Jesus' name. And friends, this is what we're called to do, to love other people. You might say, well, now, now what do I do? I'm a follower of Jesus. Great. Let's get started asking God to transform our being as we go so that we can love people with great tenderness. Great tenderness. Look with me at number two. Second fill in blank. What do we do now? Well, we need to go with presence. Would you say that with me? Go with presence. So this season of Advent that's coming up, it's the four weeks of preparation for Christmas, is all about us getting ready for celebrating that God wanted to be with us so much that he sent his son to actually move from heaven to earth into our lives and hearts. This, uh, you'll hear a fancy word around Advent, and it's the word Emmanuel, which means God with 
us. God gave us the greatest present of all. It was his very presence. And this is what Paul says that he did for these first century followers of Jesus. And it's something that we can do as well. We can give others in the name of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the gift of our presence that can for them and for many people become the very presence of God in their life. Jesus with skin on. So look with me at 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Let's read this out loud together. In fact, you read it, ready, set, go. We loved you. Yeah, we need people to come into our life who will just be there, not to fix us, not somebody that's a know-it-all, um, but somebody that can just move alongside of us and actually even be silent in our moments of despair or confusion, somebody who can stay with us in an hour of grief, somebody who can put up with not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face with us the reality of our own powerlessness. We need people to be Jesus with skin on. Others need this too. My life has been transformed because of Pastor George, has been this consistent presence in my life. I could share with you many stories. Our relationship is 34 years old. Um, but in 2008 was one of those times where George's presence made all the difference. Um, it was in July of 2008 that my dad, Howard, passed away at age 62. And it was a very terrible time in our family my brother and I uh, had to rally and plan two huge funeral services because my dad was a pastor of a giant church in Brentwood, Tennessee, as well as several churches in Kentucky where he'd pastored. So we had to do two services, one in Brentwood and then one the next day in Louisville, Kentucky. And my brother and I, uh, we made a good team. We put it all together. And yet we were up for like 36 hours straight. Families coming in, phones ringing off the hook. And um, at night, that second night, um, our family started to kind of fall apart. Um, you see, each one of us brought our own brokenness into the midst of this grief. You know, when you're, you're in grief, you can't keep the lid on some stuff anymore. And that was what was going on with our family. It was like all the skeletons in our closet started rattling. Each one of us are like miniature haunted houses sometimes. And that's true in my family. And by, the, by midnight or so, things were really bad. Pastor George had flown up from South Florida. He was in Brentwood. He came, actually, he took my wife and my son up there. And it was late at night, and yet I knew I needed help. And so I called George, who was staying with a friend. I said, George, you're going to have to come over to my mom's house. We need your help. And George got up out of bed. He made his way over to my mom's house, and he helped us. At about 3 o'clock in the morning, things had settled down. All the bedrooms were full of my mom's house. Family come in from everywhere. And uh, I laid down on the couch in my mom's living room to fall asleep. And I said, George, are you going to go back to your friends? He goes, no, I'm just going to stay here. The funeral's in like four and a half hours. So I'm just going to stay here. And George sat down in a very uncomfortable chair and fell asleep. And many times during that night, I looked over across that living room. And I was just so thankful that George was just sitting there. So many times I woke up living out this nightmare and I thought, oh, thank you, God. It's better to have a friend who's asleep than no friend at all. <laughs> it's good when we are together like that, when we help one another as we travel along. And that gift comes with our very presence. Who can you be this for? Who do you need to just show up for? Not to fix them, but just to be there. Look at me at number three. What do we do as a, new, as a result of our new life in Christ? Number three, we go with integrity. We go, yes, but we do so uh, with integrity. Paul encourages his friends that as they love their neighbors to remember the connection between the message and the messenger. So look at me at verses 9 and 10. He says, don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day we toiled to earn a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preached God's good news to you. You yourselves are our witnesses, and so is God, that we were, what's the next word? Devout. And what's the next word? And honest and faultless toward all you believers. So Paul reminds them uh, that when he came to them 
they had integrity. When, uh, integrity is when what you say and what you do and what you believe, they all line up. And so Paul had this. And this is what the world is looking for. Simple integrity. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Ed Horn who has this great integrity. Here's a picture of Ed. Uh, and he's on, the, he's on the right. I first met Ed about 10 years ago when we were getting ready to adopt the Central United Methodist Church and have it become one of the campuses of Grace Church. Pastor Arlene and I went down to visit with Ed and we were asking about what was going on at the church and uh, Ed said, well, not much is going on. That's why we're getting ready to close. You know, we need your all's help. And then Ed uh, let this slip out. He goes, well, we do have a little dinner that we do on Wednesday night. And Arlene and I were like, well, tell us more about that. And so he said, well, um, nobody from the church really comes, but me and my friend Bill, uh, he said, we started having a Wednesday night dinner for the church, but when people who are homeless started showing up, the people from the church didn't want to be around them, so they left. So Bill and I just started doing this dinner every week for a couple of years. We've been doing this, and we're like, so how many people come to this dinner? And he's like, I don't know, 75 or 100 people a week, and me and Bill just pray, and God provides food, and then we uh, have a dinner. <laughs> and Arlene and I are like, wow, that's incredible, because this guy's just a volunteer at the church. Well, now, fast forward 10 years, Ed's left his career, he's gone back to school, he's become a pastor, and now he's the campus pastor at the central campus of the United, of Grace Church. That's right. And here's what's cool. <laughs> Every week, 350 people or more gather there for meals and worship. Many of them are homeless men, women, and children. And God has used Ed and multiplied him in so many ways. Why? Because he's got integrity. See, before anybody was looking, Ed was doing what he says and what he believes. He had integrity. So speaking of integrity, a little closer to home, uh, Pastor Casey is not here today. She is our worship leader, and she's uh, home visiting her family, which is a great thing. But I want you to know, it's, it's coming up on about a year that she's been here, that I've gotten to see, see when she's not on stage that Pastor Casey is somebody with this integrity. She is a worshiper through and through. And a, com a company called Seedbed um, has noticed this about Casey and her character, and they've invited her to write Advent devotions for people all over the world. And so those are going to be coming out this Advent, and we'd like to invite you to get in on this. And so there's some instructions about how you can sign up for this devotional guide. It's called God is Here, and every morning you and uh, at least 15,000 other people will get one of these devotions and then next year, it's going to be actually coming a book. And uh, Casey's just writing her experience as a worshiper, and she wants to share it with you. And so you can sign up uh, there. There's some instructions in your notes. And also, she's going to be offering an opportunity on Wednesday nights just to escape the chaos of December and come and be with the Lord, to be in his presence, to recognize that God is here. This comes from Casey's just simple integrity. This is who she is just spilling out through her keyboard and prayers to other people. All right, look with me at the last, last one. All right, number four, what are we to do now? Now that we've experienced this new life in Christ, we need to go with passion. Say that with me. Go with passion. What's your passion in life? You have a passion? Uh, look with me at what Paul says he and his friend's passion is. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. How about you read it? Here we go. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his children. We pleaded with you. So if you're taking notes, underline these three words. We pleaded with you. We encouraged you. And we urged you. Like a father would a child. Have you ever seen a dad on a t-ball field or a soccer field cheering on their kids, pleading, encouraging, and urging them? That's just beginning to catch the intensity, the passion that Paul has for these people. And each one of these qualities, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can have in our daily life and in our relationships with other people, that we would have this fire inside of us that comes from the Holy Spirit. Not that we would pray, uh, as Pastor George taught us last week, that we would just get more from God, 
but that we would have more of God in our life. That God would move more of heaven into our hearts so that we can share that with other people. So what ignites your soul today? What are you passionate about? Let me ask it another way. What are you passionate about that's going to last into eternity? What's going to matter into eternity? I'm passionate about college sports, but that ain't going to last into eternity. I'm passionate about fishing, but that ain't going to matter in the light of eternity. Some people are passionate about their jobs, and some people are passionate about making money, and some people are passionate about real estate, and some people are passionate about politics. But I want to ask the question this way. What are you passionate about that's going to last into eternity that long, that's going to make a difference in heaven with that in our view? Can I share with you what I believe really matters in the light of eternity? God matters in the light of eternity. Jesus matters in the light of eternity. The power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God living inside of each one of us matters in the light of eternity. Us loving other people in Jesus' name, making the realities of heaven, the realities of earth, that's what matters in the light of eternity. That's what really is going to last. It's what matters. So one of the best examples for all of these things, including passion, has been my mom, Sandy. My mom, Sandy's a fully devoted disciple of Jesus. She's not perfect, but God's not finished with her yet. (laughs) And my mom loves Jesus, and because of that, she loves people. And during her teaching career, she was a kindergarten teacher for nearly 30 years, she used that as one opportunity to share the love of Jesus with people. And one of her students was a young man by the name of Asadala Nuwabi. Asad came to the United States When the Soviet Union, 40 years ago, invaded Afghanistan, and Assad's uncle was the president of Afghanistan, so they had to go into hiding, and they hid in the mountains of Afghanistan in a refugee camp for two years. Well, our little church in central Kentucky was part of a a refugee resettlement ministry, and Assad's family got connected to our little town in central Kentucky, and Assad, now eight years old, who knows no English, lands in my mom's kindergarten class. And my mom decides she's going to love this boy and not just for the school year. And so as Assad grew up, my mom was constantly in touch with him. There's not uh, too many weeks that go by that my mom and Assad are not together. In fact, the Nawabi family and the Olds family have found some connecting points. Uh, My parents have been guests in their parents' homes. And um, when my dad had cancer, Assad drove down to Nashville to just hang out and be with my dad. When 9-11 happened, Assad's brother was attacked on the University of Louisville campus because he was a Muslim. And he called and their family called our family to ask for us to pray for them during that whole thing. When my mom was retiring, we asked Assad to be the keynote speaker at her retirement banquet. And he brought the heat. It was awesome. He shared about the love that my mom had for him. Well, um, I asked Assad's permission to share this story. And when he texted me back, He said, of course, yes, you can share this story, Wes, because we are family. So here's what's been happening. Lately, Jesus has been appearing to Assad in his dreams. And what do you do if you're a Muslim and Jesus starts showing up in your dreams? Well, if you're Assad, you call your kindergarten teacher Sandy. And you ask for help. We have a picture, I think, of them together recently. I don't know if y'all put that one up or not. But when he came over to talk to my mom about this, I thought, how good is God? That my mom, who has 20-20 vision as a disciple of Jesus, could it be that through the power of the Holy Spirit that God is taking her vision and putting it in Assad's vision? So that Assad can meet and know Jesus and know that he's a child of God and person of worth. I'm going to have lunch with Assad in a few weeks when I go up there to visit. But here's what I know right now. My mom is somebody who's gone out and served Jesus with great tenderness and patience and passion. She has done it with great integrity and it makes a difference. You and I are invited to get in on this too. To make the realities of heaven the realities of of earth to help what's up there come down here and here's the cool thing about it when you and I do this when we're just tender with people when we're just present 
when we just have simple integrity, when we're just passionate about them and the love that God has for them, guess what happens? We become the very answer to Jesus' prayer that he taught his disciples to pray. Look with me at this verse, Matthew 6, 10. Let's read it out loud together. Here we go. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Grace Church, can you catch the vision? Let's join Jesus in moving heaven to earth. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to have a prayer together, and then we're going to sing a closing song, and the altar will be open. If you want to pray about this, maybe you need more tenderness. Maybe you need some passion to ignite your soul. Whatever it is, if it's this or something else, there'll be some prayer partners that are here at the altar and you're invited to come and they'll pray with you or you can make your seat a place of prayer. If you want somebody to pray with you, just lift a hand and we'll have somebody come do that. Right now, let's stand and let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us right now to catch a vision where we don't see a difference between heaven and earth. Lord, Lord, we see that the kingdom of heaven is near and that you want to use us, all the poor and the powerless, even lost and lonely people, to share the good news of your grace. So Lord, we ask that you would empower us right now and you meet us right where we are. We thank you for your love and your grace in Jesus' name. Everybody green said, amen. Amen. Let's worship together.